it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. If someone tells you you're crazy enough times, eventually it becomes true. It's that old psychiatrist's joke. Insanity. It's all in your head. Five stories about insane asylums for you this evening. And first up we have... Eerie Asylum. January 15th, 1996. I've been dreaming about Eerie Asylum again. The dreams start off normal, like a lot of my dreams. It's just random images, things that I've seen, places I've been, scenes from TV shows and the occasional flight over my old hometown. But while I'm flying, staring out across the expanse of houses, schools, shops, and the maze of roads that connect them all, my focus is drawn to the asylum. And then everything takes a turn for the worse. I'm inside the hospital. In the main hallway. The doors are closed behind me and everything's the same as when I visited. The paint's peeling off the walls. There are random pieces of debris scattered about. Pieces of plasterboard from the ceiling and the odd discarded needle or beer bottle. The lights are all on, but most of the light bulbs have either been smashed or just don't work. There's a flickering light bulb up ahead. I can see that there's someone beneath it, but... Whenever the light flicks on, they vanish. I recognize the silhouette, but I can't place it. Then there's a sound behind me, and when I turn around, dozens of patients have appeared out of nowhere. They look like they never left the hospital when it closed 20 years ago. Their white cotton clothes and straitjackets are stained with dirt and blood. Their bodies are so frail that they look almost inhuman. Their eyes are all fixed on me, glowering and unblinking start walking towards me. Slowly, I back away, but they just keep coming, following me. I turn. The person under the light is gone, and I run. I run through the halls, deeper into the maze of hallways and rooms. They're carrying things now. Needles filled with strange colored liquids. Some of them have scalpels, surgical scissors, and implements. Some hold IV stands like clubs and swing them at me as I run. They've spread out, and they're closing in. I turn another corner and run through the darkness. It's claws grabbing at me, trying to slow me down, and when I stumble into the light, I'm caught by a familiar figure. Brown eyes and sickly pale skin. It's him, the one that I couldn't say. He grabs me and drags me toward a room. It's stark and white. He holds me down while two others strap me to a table. The others have assembled a tray of IV bags and knives and scissors and needles and probes and clips and surgical masks. They pull on the scrubs without ever breaking eye contact. And before they can set about their gruesome work, I wake up. I wonder if this is a sign that I need to put these ghosts to rest, that I need to see him. Or maybe it's just my guilty mind that conjured up this dream as a way to punish me, or maybe to give me hope of redemption. I'm not sure. But, well, I think that I need to go back to Eerie Asylum. January 17th, 1996. I'm staying in Eerie Hotel. Everything around here is named after the town. Given the choice between staying in a town called Smithville and a town called Erie, a tourist picked Erie. Oh, the novelty wore off before it even began when you were born there. But no one recognizes me. I'm happy about that. I don't want anybody connecting me to Amanda Rose. I use the name Anna York because I think that everyone would get a bit suspicious I still look like I did 20 years ago, just 20 years older, and I'm worried that using my own name might jog people's memories. I don't want to get run out of town before I can get closure. I decided that I wouldn't go up to the asylum today. I asked the owner of the hotel about the asylum. 
I told her that I was researching it because I hoped to write a fictional horror story set around the hospital's past. She was a little reluctant at first, but upon realising how if the book became popular, it would bring more people to the town, she was quick to open up. I have never looked into the history of the asylum much. I was too busy trying to bury those memories deep in my subconscious. But I did find out that Eerie Asylum was commissioned to be built by Edward Eerie, the town's namesake, after his father fell ill. But Edward Eerie used the asylum to conduct experiments of an unethical nature. He used the patients as guinea pigs for his more bizarre and unscientific practices. The hospital continued to dabble with the occult and the paranormal after Erie went insane and was admitted to his own hospital. But the legacy of Edward Erie ended when the entire hospital was examined after the death of a seemingly unimportant woman whose daughter married into money and was able to use her newfound power to look into the asylum's sketchy practices. Most of the doctors were sent to prison for murder and gross misconduct. And Amanda Rose, the chief of medicine, committed suicide rather than face the court. Well, the hotel owner, who I found out was called Maggie, said that the family of that bitch Rose stayed in town for nearly 13 years, but left after Amanda Rose's only child, the one named after Frankenstein's maker, oh, I can only roll my eyes, was involved in the death of the mayor's son. I left at that point. I thanked her for her help and went down the street to the town's oldest cafe. I ordered a coffee from a miserable-looking teen behind the counter who looked startlingly like Sarah McCallan, a girl that I used to go to school with. I sat in the booth for hours, and eventually my suspicions were confirmed when a very tired-looking Sarah took over from her son. I decided to leave at that point. Sarah and I had been close friends up until I left, and if anyone would recognise me, it was her. I bought a map of the forest trails from the newsagents, traced out the way up to the asylum. The trail wasn't marked, but I still remembered where it split off from the main trail and wound its way up to the main gates. I'm going to go tomorrow. I'll walk the trail to the hospital, and hopefully I'll find Daniel and leave. I'll finally have some kind of peace. January 18th, 1996. This was a mistake. I should never have come. I never believed in ghosts. I thought that whatever the doctors were doing here, they were just doing it because it was fun, and that they'd been pressured into it by the other staff. I was wrong. That dream wasn't an invitation. It was bait. I woke up early this morning, and I hiked up the trail. I found my way easily. I always used to like peeking through the gates. The eerie Gothic architecture was foreboding, it filled me with a terrifying fascination of the building, but I'd never entered before. Not before that day. When I entered, everything was like my dream, except there were no patients waiting to dissect me, and no figure under the light. I was relieved. For a while. I wandered through the asylum. It still looked abandoned, and no one had any parties here. Everyone was too scared. I found that some brave souls had ventured up here to spray the walls with brightly coloured paints, but the deeper I went, the fewer tags there were. I eventually found something very disturbing, at least to me. A half-finished tag and a bottle of red spray paint on the ground. Even more worrying, there were deep maroon splatters on the floor. It wasn't the paint. It was blood. I decided then and there that this was a mistake and I needed to leave right now. But the asylum had other ideas. When I got to the doors, for the first time in years, they were sealed shut. And when I turned around, I saw something that filled me with dread. The figure under the light, flickering in and out of sight with the light. And when I turned around... I knew what I was going to see. They were standing there, standing in a line in front of the doors, and in front of them, right behind me, was Daniel. His once warm brown eyes were dead and dull. There was no shine of life in them, 
just hatred. The expression seemed to be burnt into his face. You should never have come back. I did the only thing that I could. I turned and I ran. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. But whatever corner I turned, he was there. I locked myself into one of the observation rooms. I can feel him behind the glass, staring at me. Oh my god. He's at the door. He opened the door a few minutes ago. He's just standing there, staring at me. I can barely see for the tears. I wanted closure. I died for closure. And so, I got it. I wiped the tears from my eyes and whispered that I was sorry. Daniel just looked at me, and a smile spread across his face. It was unsettling, not because of how insane it looked, but because of how much it looked like Daniel, the real Daniel, and not this apparition. I know, and you're going to make it up to me. I don't think that Daniel ever died in this hospital. I think that whatever the doctors and my mother brought here, well, it kept him alive and it turned him into something else. And I think he wants to turn me into one too. But please, if you find this, don't come looking for me. Please, run. Just run. Ginger's Asylum. Think about spiders on their webs. Eight long, thin legs hold on effortlessly to the white strands. They stay so still, they become nearly invisible. Yet you know they're there, waiting for a victim to fall into their bitter trap, only to be devoured from the inside, slowly, mercilessly. That's like Harley. It's what he does to you. My half-brother Jacob and I had always been very close. He and I could talk about anything and everything together. We trusted each other and had the best brother-sister relationship that everyone should be jealous of. He was two years older than me. Well, we looked very alike. Solid grey eyes, dark brown hair and fair skin. He was very tall, though, and he was the best player on Fexton High's basketball team. He was very passionate about the sport, always was. We had the same mother and lived with her, but I never met my dad. He'd left before I was born, but his dad lived in the next town, to Fenton. Jacob would visit him often. He always talked about his dad with a gleam in his eye. It was obvious that Jacob loved his dad immensely. Around August, when I was 15, I noticed well, drastic changes in Jacob. He was refraining from talking to anybody, even me. Me, his best friend, his own sister. He spent days locked up in his room. I don't even know how he'd get food or go to the bathroom. He was just always in there. In mid-September, my mother called me down to her room. Jacob was still in his room, silent. I made my way down the stairs to her room. She told me to sit at the foot of her bed. And that's when she told me. Jacob's dad passed away. That's why he's been acting this way. I became furious at her for not telling me, and after a few minutes of pointless arguing, I walked out of the door, through the living room, and out of the house. I made down the sidewalk along the road, the cold air hurting in my lungs. I needed to cool off. About an hour later, I returned. I jogged up the stairs and paused by Jacob's room. Hesitantly, I opened the door. It creaked. Everything was dark. I couldn't see. Jacob, I said quietly. I walked into his room, my hand on the wall, trying to find the light switch. I'm sorry, Mum just told me. There he was, dead. Hanging inside the closet across the room was his body, his face pale, lips blue. My brother had killed himself. 
Weeks passed and I was severely depressed and traumatized. I couldn't sleep, I barely ate. Breathing was a burden to me. I was miserable. Without my brother, I felt so alone. It was then I realized he wasn't only my best friend, he was my only friend. And now he was gone forever. One night in late October, I'd had enough. I couldn't take the pain anymore. It was all too much for me. I couldn't bear it. Silently, I slipped into the kitchen and grabbed the sharpest steak knife there. I crawled back up to my room and collapsed, crying hysterically. I held onto the blade tightly and pressed it up against my arm. It slipped my veins deeply and it hurt. I did the same to my other arm. I fell onto the floor, bleeding and drifting off into what I hoped was absolute death. When I woke up, I was in a white room. I smelled stale medicine and heard something beeping. Shit. I was in a hospital. She's awake, said someone, and I heard a sudden rush of footsteps coming my way. A doctor, two nurses, and some man in a black suit stood there. Oh, my mum was nowhere in sight. When I asked about her, the questions went through one ear and out the other. I was sure she'd found me in my room, but where would she have gone? After a series of questions and examinations, the man in the black suit told me that he'd be taking me to a safe place until he was sure I was ready to go home. I was confused until I read the logo on the clipboard he held. Ginger's Asylum. No, I didn't want to go. Hell, I just wanted to die, get all of this bullshit over with. But I didn't put up a fight. I didn't want to make things worse. Needless to say, I was brought to the asylum, put in a room with only a mattress and pillow on the floor. Paintings hung on the walls, made by other patients. The first few days and nights there, I put myself in the fetal position, moving only to take my meds and force myself to eat. It was horrible. It made me want to die even more. How long will I be here? I asked one of the nurses who'd come in to check on me. She jumped, startled by the fact I'd said anything at all. She looked at me confusingly, as if she were just realizing I was in the room with her. Then her face cleared. About a week or two, she said plainly. Obviously, she'd answered the question numerous times. My jaw dropped. Two weeks? She nodded and left the room. I put myself in the fetal position once more and allowed myself to cry. That night, unable to sleep, I stood from the bed. The bandages were tight around my arms. I opened the door silently, and it luckily didn't creak. The hallway was dimly lit and empty. I walked out cautiously and made my way down the hall, headed wherever my legs would take me. There was an eerie feel to the quiet asylum, especially since the dark skies didn't illuminate through the windows. However, knowing I'd watched one too many horror movies about these places, I brushed off the feeling and kept on walking down the hall. I soon came to a flight of stairs. Not thinking, I made my way down. But it soon became pitch black, but I kept on walking. The stairs seemed to go on for miles and miles, and then I realized that not even the elevators go down this way. I knew I shouldn't have gone, but I was too distracted by the rage and sadness I felt. Suddenly small sounds and creaks made it clear just how ancient this part of the building was. I guess the workers here hadn't put any signs up to prevent anyone from going here because any sensible person would have turned around long ago. When I realized I'd begun walking on flat ground, I noticed the air smelled like old wood. I sneezed as the dust gathered up into my nostrils. I didn't care about the cool air crawling up my spine. I didn't care about the odd feeling I had down here. Normally I'd be terrified of such darkness, but my mind was too clouded with self-hatred and misery to feel fear. I walked on into the blackness, not seeing anything for what felt like hours. And then, I stopped in my tracks. In the distance, there was a dim light. I continued toward it, goosebumps on my arms from the dripping cold. When I made it there, I realized there was a light bulb illuminating an old-looking rusted door. A handwritten sign in smeared ink read, Caution, do not enter. I snickered a little, and I think it hurt me now. 
I was sure I'd reached the limit in mental and emotional pain. Physical pain seemed so small now, so weak. I stared at the door when I realised I was attracted to it. It's hard to explain. It was almost as if someone was calling me towards it. I absent-mindedly reached out for the door handle. When I felt uncontrollably sick, I looked in the other direction and threw up everywhere. I wiped my mouth with my arm and turned back to the open door. Well, this time I managed to get the handle without barfing, but as my fingers rested on it, I couldn't help but feel extremely sick. I brushed it off with some nausea from the medicine. I turned the handle and pushed the door open. I emptied my stomach again, looking up into the room. I saw there was a single old light bulb. The empty space was a dark orange, making the corners dark, and I'll admit, I began to get pretty scared here. But what happened next is unexplainable, at least to me. Something behind me shoved me into the room, and the door slammed shut behind me. My heart pounded heavily against my chest as the hot, suffocating air poured into my lungs. I was shaking violently, throwing up everywhere. I think it was the silence afterwards that terrified me. Everything was quiet, still. There was nothing in this room apart from the four walls. But it seemed well, abnormally quiet. Something wasn't right here at all. Especially now that I was locked inside some room in the deepest part of Ginger's asylum. I stood against the door to my knees, staring at the wall as sweat trickled down my face, almost as if I was waiting for the wall to grow arms and slam me into it over and over until my skull was crushed. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw something move. Instinctively, I turned. Nothing. My eyes were playing tricks on me, but then it happened again. And again. And yet again. Then a shadow appeared before me. It was in the shape of a short person, perhaps a child. But what I heard next wasn't a child's voice. No, not even a human voice. What I heard was enough to send violent chills down my spine, making the fear pump through my veins like venom. Hello there, Jessica said with an emphasis on the S's in my name. His voice sounded like ten put together. How, how do you know my name? What the fuck are you? Get me out of here! I whined desperately, my voice trembling. But this was only responded to by horrid laughter. I'm Harley, silly. I know everyone's name, it said mockingly. The shadow then darted from the centre of my room to a dark corner. You can't leave just yet. I screamed. A lot. I was terrified. Don't be scared, little Jessica, it said. Harley doesn't want to hurt you. What do you want with me then? My body was cemented into its spot. I couldn't move. I don't even know how I managed to speak. Harley wants to be your friend, Jessica. We can be best friends forever. Began to scream louder and louder. It got out of its corner and made its way to me. Don't be afraid, little Jessica. Harley just needs a friend. It moved closer and closer, and I was paralyzed. Forever. His voice echoed through my ears. Forever. Suddenly, an unseen force made my mouth open, and I saw the creature sliding into me. When it had gone completely, I began to cry, and I heard it speaking to me. Harley wants to keep you safe, he said. You belong to me now. Well, I couldn't stop screaming or crying. I stood, yanked on the door handle and broke it. The door slid open and I darted out into the darkness. 
Stop that, it said. The creepy childlike tone faded away. Now it was a bitter demonic tone. Go back now. Tears rolled down my face as I ran into the blackness anyway, knowing there was a being inside of me, in my soul. Stop running, it screamed in my head. A sharp pain shot through my neck all the way down to my knees, making me collapse. I tried to get back up, but every time I moved a muscle it felt as if part of my body were being dipped in acid. Harley just laughed at my painful screams. Bones began to snap. He was breaking me from the inside. I threw up even more. The taste in my mouth was now metallic. Blood. Stop doing this to me, I cried, but he only laughed more. You should have listened to Harley, it said, continuing to break me. So be careful. Always keep the lights on. Never go into abandoned rooms. Don't go exploring at night. And never think, not even for a second, that the shadows you see from the corners of your eyes are just optical tricks. Because Harley is always looking for new friends. But, most importantly, always listen to Harley. Penhurst Asylum. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. Over and over again, the voices in my head tell me the exact same thing. I'd hate to admit, but the offer sounds tempting as I look at the other people sitting at the table across from me in the hospital cafeteria. Oh, I believe I forgot to mention that I am in an asylum deep in the back roads of Pennsylvania. I'm sure that you haven't heard the true story of this place, due to the fact that some of the world's worst experiments have been held here, and for the sake of the people, the events that have happened have been mostly covered up. This place is called the Penhurst Asylum. The Penhurst Asylum, as you may know, is recognized today as a haunted tourist attraction. But I remember it as the hellhole that I called home for many years. I leave here for you my journal entries during my time in Penhurst, while under the experimentation of Dr. Heinrich Chakajian. October 1982 I've been transferred to this place from my former prison in Europe. My new home is called Penhurst, and I guess it was an old school or hospital. Honestly, I wonder why the fuck I was transferred here in the first place. Well, I guess I have no right to complain since I'm sentenced for life. It's uh, better than the alternative. Actually, now that I think of it, I'd almost rather be dead. To know that all I have to look forward to is the eventual occurrence of death. The desire to go on slowly fades away as the days drag on. I heard rumours from the other inmates that there's a doctor here who has inmates taken to him and they just, well, disappear. I can tell you now that I do not wish to meet him, and hopefully I won't. February 1983 Over the past four months, the inmates have been disappearing more and more. Even my new friend Darren. Darren and I met during lunch about two months back. He and I hit it off very well. Turns out he also used to live in Pennsylvania, just as I had before we were transferred to Europe to our new prison home. We discussed why we were here in the first place. I was sentenced for murder of a family of six. He was sentenced for manslaughter of, I believe, two people. Funny enough, we didn't let our past actions corrupt our friendship. We actually looked at it as a form of common interest, but Darren was taken away a few days ago. I'm not entirely sure why. I need to find out what happened to him, and I hope I'm not next. April 1983 The guards in my section seem to be taking different inmates away. I can tell my time is coming. 
I don't know what to do. Escape? Well, I'm not sure how the hell I'm going to get out of this place. It's too heavily guarded. I, I hear them coming to my cell. I don't want to die. March 1984. He took me away. He took me away and did things to me. Unexplainable things. The flash of lights, the blur of red mist. My entire back is burning. He cut it open and performed some kind of surgery on it. I can feel the stitches in my back, sealing up where he cut into my flesh. But, wait, I feel something in my back. In the center of my back, on both sides of my spine. I feel some sort of lump on each side. May... 1984. The lumps in my back seem to be growing larger. It feels as if they're about to burst. I can't take the pain anymore. I must find out what the fuck Dr. Heinrich did to me. I'm cutting open my back and taking out whatever it is he put in there. May 1984. Later that night. I cut my back open with a piece of the mirror that was in my cell. I can't take the lumps out, and they seem to be growing. What the fuck has he done to me? I hear screaming coming from the upper floors. More prisoners being taken away? Why am I lasting so long? What's so special about me? Why can't he just kill me already? I have so long for death, and this sure as hell isn't helping. I may as well slit my own throat with this mirror shard. You know what? I may just... Wait, I hear the guards coming. Oh, God, no. Not again. I don't want to see the doctor again. He's going to do those horrible experiments on me again. August 1985. I'm surprised I'm still alive. I guess I've been unconscious for over a year now. I'm horribly thin and, well, almost dead. I wish I was. The lumps on my back have grown into large, horn-like bones. The bones rip through my flesh, and now my back is completely covered in blood. I should be dead. I should be dead. I should be fucking dead by now. But no, he won't let me die. That freaking insane doctor. If only I could get my hands on him, or tear his throat out. November 1985. I hate how the other inmates look at me in the cafeteria. They see what Heinrich has done to me, and they stare in fear at the monstrosity that he's created. Actually, I'm surprised they even feed us at all in this damn place. Although the portions of food are usually a small plate of steamed chopped potatoes or something simple like that. The fearful eyes of the other inmates focus on my torn and bloody back. I can feel their stares burning into my mind. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. I hear those voices through my head, and the thought of killing every single one of these motherfuckers sounds absolutely satisfying. January 1986. I heard the inmates were planning an escape from this hellhole. <laughs> sounds like fun. I hope to take this opportunity to kill Dr. Heinrich myself, and... Maybe a few of the other inmates that glare at me whenever I'm eating. I've decided that I'm going to eat them. Those horrible fucking people I have to deal with on top of the agonizing pain from the experiments that Dr. Heinrich has done to me. I can't take it anymore. The time to act is now. I will be free from this damn facility. I'll start with the assholes in the cafeteria. Kill them off as quickly and as brutally as possible. Then I'll make my escape. I'm ready. January 1986. Later that day. I've decided to keep this journal with me so I can remember all the shit I went through in my time at Penhurst Asylum. Truly, it was a living hell. My favourite part, though, was the very end of my stay. I helped myself to the flesh of the other inmates. Oh, I was so hungry. Not anymore, though. Tearing my way through the asylum, I found the body of my old friend Darren. So, 
I did all I could think of. I took the body with me. And supposedly the building burst into flames on the second floor of the administrative building. Good. That place deserves to burn down. I've retreated away from Penhurst Asylum. I can't stand the look of that place. I keep Darren with me in my new home that's a couple of miles away from Penhurst. A small rusty old shack, but it's a better home than any other place I've ever known. Well, the rotting stench of Darren's corpse is getting unbearable, though. I guess I'll have to eat him. I wouldn't dare bury him. I don't want him to waste away in the ground. So why not become a part of me? Lately I've been so hungry. No more bodies to feed on. Normal food just isn't the same now that I've tasted human flesh. And I must feed. Soon. There's a small town nearby. The young ones look so delicious. Such new and soft skin. It'll be wonderful. I'm sure the adults wouldn't mind if I just took one. Or a few. The Asylum My friends and I used to do a lot of geocaching after our senior year in high school. For those who don't know what geocaching is, it's essentially a worldwide scavenger hunt. People will select sites and conceal a geocache somewhere unobtrusive, then post GPS coordinates on geocaching websites where other searchers can download the cords and locate the cache. Usually, People who've found the object, often it's a chest or something hollow, will leave a note or small personal memento for future searchers to find and appreciate. There are several types of geocaches, and most of them are thematic in nature, such as scenic destinations, romantic sites, hard-to-reach areas, and so on. This story begins when my friends and I decided to try a series of purportedly haunted locales within about an hour's drive of our hometown. It began innocently enough. Most of the sites had spooky backstories that were, of course, entirely fabricated. So we had a great time scaring the piss out of each other and generally creeping ourselves out. We'd begun searching after the sun had set to enhance the creep factor, but by around midnight... Most of our large group had dwindled off and gone their separate ways. When we reached our last cohort, there was just myself, Rebecca, Kevin, and Evan left, and we were determined to knock it off our list. Rebecca was our guide for the night, in charge of putting in the coordinates and reading us the backstory behind each site. So, while I drove, she began reading about the last one out loud to the rest of us. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of this. Henkel Asylum, constructed in the early 1900s. The James Henkel Asylum was built to house a burgeoning population of the criminally insane. Men who had committed vile crimes, rape, murder, torture, without signs of remorse, were deemed mentally unstable and sent to this facility for further study and rehabilitation. Once committed, very few criminals were ever released back into society, and those that were usually had been given frontal lobotomies, a popular experimental procedure at the time, or electroshock therapy, both of which rendered the patient nearly brain-dead, capable of performing only rudimentary tasks. Stories. Contemporary visitors to the asylum report hearing banging noises, cell doors opening and closing, and hearing cackling laughter that is abruptly cut short. Well, it was pretty standard fare compared to the rest of the sites we'd visited that night, and we naturally had a good time psyching each other out for the next fifteen minutes while I drove us to the asylum. We'd all heard about it. It was in our local area, after all, and we knew it had been condemned and abandoned since as long as any of us could remember, so we'd figured it'd be a great place to run around and be reckless teenagers, without the risk of getting yelled at by the cops. 
when we finally arrived, it looked like something straight out of one of those cheesy B-movies a show on sci-fi. Chain link fence with barbed wire around the perimeter. Two guard towers flanking the main gate, which was, of course, chained and locked shut with a big no trespassing sign hanging from it. The asylum itself was decrepit, looking like it hadn't been touched for decades, which was surprising since we grew up in a pretty nice area where the municipal lawmakers tried to keep everything looking spiffy for the tourists. Needless to say, we promptly ignored the sign on the front gate and hauled ourselves over, cameras and GPS in hand, and walked towards the asylum. Now, given our attitude towards the previous sites, you've probably gathered that I'm somewhat of a skeptic. I believe that there are paranormal things that can't be explained yet, but I'm not exactly summoning demons in front of a bathroom mirror. So, when we opened the main door to the asylum, conveniently unlocked, I dismissed the cold burst of wind as just stale, pent-up air rushing out after being trapped inside for so long. My friend's bravado, however, quickly disappeared, and they began shuffling their feet nervously at the entrance, hesitant to cross that invisible threshold. I took point, chivying them along with prodding taunts, and eventually everyone was inside. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Things were relatively clean, and the entire building looked like it had been gutted. The paint was peeling, Tiles popping up here and there, and the metal trim near the baseboards of the wall was in desperate need of some rust be gone. But aside from that, the place was entirely empty. No crazy-ass chairs with leather straps. No gurneys lying haphazardly around. Just an old reception desk, and two hallways leading off to the different wings. We explored for a few minutes freaking ourselves out whenever we heard an old pipe rattle or rat squeak, but otherwise it was relatively uneventful. Our fears safely suppressed by the presence of each other, we began to get more adventurous, opening doors and peeking inside. The rooms were all empty, of course. Whatever company had been contracted to clear the place out did a pretty decent job of removing any creepy decor. Bravado returning by the minute. Evan and Kevin dropped back without Rebecca or me noticing. They began running around, making noises to try and scare us. Okay, I'm not going to lie. It worked until I realized they were gone and probably the cause of all the racket. Then returned, laughing and breathless, to a decidedly paler Rebecca. She seemed to be a lot more put off by the whole place than the rest of us. Or at least... She didn't hide it as well. She quietly suggested we leave. Not to be outdone by the other guys of the group, I told her she was more than welcome to wait in the car if she wanted, but I was going to stick around for a few more minutes. Exasperated but defeated, she finally caved and followed us where the GPS was leading, the second floor. This is where I started to feel genuinely scared. Before, I was just kind of creeped out. But there was something about that whole floor that literally gave me the shivers, despite it being a warm summer night. We started opening doors like before, but we were all a lot more sober about it. I guess I wasn't the only one who was feeling weird. Finally, about midway through the hall, we opened the door to a room, and there, lying in the middle of the floor, was an honest-to-God straitjacket. I'm not bullshitting you. Every other room was devoid of objects, but there it was. A fucking straitjacket in the middle of the floor of some random-ass room in a condemned mental asylum. We all kind of looked at each other, and with raised eyebrows, as if to say, Um, guys, you seeing what I'm seeing? 
and of course, trying to be a macho man to show off for Rebecca, I piped up with the most ridiculous idea I could think of at the time. Dude, I'm going to put it on. Oh, years of horror flicks and creepy pasta should have trained me to not put on the creepy straitjacket. In the creepy hall, in the creepy asylum. But teenage dumb fuckery won over. And once the words were out, I, well, just couldn't was out. Nobody said anything. They just kind of looked at me expectantly, waiting to see if I'd follow through with my boast. Determined not to be called a pussy for the rest of the night, I walked forward into the room and bent down to pick up the moth-ridden restraining device. As I got closer, though, I noticed it wasn't moth-ridden at all, but it was actually in pretty decent condition. That is, compared to the rest of the place, which, as I've mentioned, was in shambles. I mean, it had a few stains here and there, but it didn't really smell, and it seemed intact enough to put on. As soon as I picked it up, though, I got this overwhelming sense of dread. You know, that drop in the pit of your stomach right as you go over the lip of a roller coaster. Well, that feeling in the bottom of your gut that says, I'm going to die. I just know it. Yep, well, I got that. Really strong and totally ignored it. My desire not to die was outweighed, as it often is in teenagers, by my need to look cool for my friends. So, I slipped my hands in the sleeves, one at a time, until it hung loosely from my shoulders. Now, if you've ever seen a stray jacket, you know that you can't tie it up yourself. The whole point is to essentially cross your arms across your chest and tie the sleeves behind your back to prevent whoever's inside from moving their arms, presumably to stop them from hurting themselves or others. So, as I stood there in the middle of the room, I called out to Rebecca. Hey, Becca, help me tie this thing off. She looked, if you'll excuse the pun, as pale as a ghost, but she managed to squeak out. I I don't think this is a good idea. But again, after some prodding and encouraging, I convinced her to begin tying the sleeves behind my back. Evan and Kevin just stood in the doorway, expressions a mix of admiration and incredulity. At that point in time, I felt like a badass. Well, for about three seconds. As soon as Rebecca finished up the last lace, the door to the cell slammed shut, right in Kevin and Evan's faces. I never felt a breeze, And when I asked them later, both of them fervently denying closing it themselves. Skeptic that I am, I still chalk it up to us leaving the front door open and changing air pressures and all that. But it scared the piss out of us nonetheless. Then I felt a pressure on my chest, like someone was sitting on it, or as if someone was pulling the sleeves tighter behind me and it began to get harder to breathe. I couldn't even summon enough air to whisper, much less call out for help. My vision narrowed to tiny specks. I swear I heard someone laughing shrilly as I neared unconsciousness. The pressure increased with a sudden tug, and my world went black. When I woke up, my vision was foggy, Or at least I thought it was, until I realized it wasn't just foggy. It was dark, like staring through a lens that's been collecting soot. I blinked a few times, and the darkness wavered, but didn't dissipate. Now, I've passed out and blacked out before, but whenever I woke up, it was nothing like that. Either my vision gradually cleared up, or it was blurry, 
Never in my life have I been able to recreate the shadowy haze I saw in the asylum that night. Then, from the murky depths, two small pinpoints of light appeared a few inches in front of my face, glaring a lurid red, and a dim echo of the laughter I heard before surrounded me. As soon as they appeared, however, they were replaced by two brilliant shafts of incandescence, Evan and Kevin, shining flashlights down on my face. The last thing I remember hearing before I lost consciousness was Rebecca's scream and the door banging open, which probably explains why those two were standing over me with flashlights in hand. I gradually became aware of a dull murmur that I recognized as Rebecca asking me, Please, wake up. Please, 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 wake up. As she shook me, she just kept saying it over and over again, kept sobbing and shaking me. When my vision cleared enough, I glanced over and saw that her eyes were completely red, like she'd been crying for a while. Trying to muster some shred of manliness, I found myself speaking in a surprisingly calm voice, given how I was actually feeling. I remember distinctly what I said, word for word. Get those fucking flashlights out of my face, you douchebags. Expecting a laugh, or at least some reciprocal insults, I was kind of shocked when they just looked at each other quizzically, seemingly surprised. You're... You're okay? Evan asked, incredulously. Yeah, why the hell wouldn't I be? Becca just tied the things too tight. I couldn't breathe, so I passed out. How long was I out for anyway? I inquired. Apparently, it had been long enough for them to untie the straitjacket, allowing me to rub a hand across my face. Another shared look of disbelief. Dude, Kevin began slowly. You've been out for like 15 minutes. We were about to call 911. We kept shaking you. Evan even tried pinching you so hard he drew blood, but you wouldn't wake up. I felt a cold chill run down my spine. And the straitjacket, hanging limply from my shoulders, suddenly began to feel a bit tighter. Hastening to pull it off, I tried not to look panicked as I threw it to a corner of the room. Rebecca just sat there, still shaking and crying a little bit, and in spite of the ordeal I'd just gone through, I had enough sense to go over and try to comfort her. We left that room without a word, geocache be damned, and walked back to the car in complete silence, broken only by the occasional sniffle from Rebecca. The sun started coming up, and as I dropped everyone off at their respective homes, we said quiet goodbyes. Rebecca was the last stop before I finally made the trip home myself. Being the gentleman that I am, I walked her to her door, but she paused at the entry and looked me in the eye. In the grey light of dawn, I could see her eyes were still reddened from all the crying. She was very quiet, and she said, I have to ask you something. Yeah, sure. What is it? I said, half expecting another, You sure you're all right? Like I'd been getting the whole ride home. And she surprised me by asking, Do you know how long it took Evan and Kevin to get the door open? Her eyes held a look, that I could never forget. It was raw fear. Something happened in that fraction of time between me blacking out and them getting in there that had absolutely terrified her. And seeing that look, I realized. I was blacked out for 15 minutes. How long was she alone in that room? No. I replied slowly. How long? 
Five minutes. They said it took five minutes for them to open that stupid door. I was in there, and I saw you, and I saw... She broke off, another sob stopping her mid-sentence. At that point, I didn't want to know. I still don't want to know. I gripped her by her shoulders and said firmly, Rebecca, it doesn't matter. No matter what you saw, I'm here. You're here. We're both safe. It doesn't matter. Nothing bad will happen, I promise. She just nodded numbly, opened her door, and walked inside her house. The next time I saw her, she was back to her usual self. But whenever I bring up that night to her, she freezes up and turns to stone, refusing to discuss it. I stand by what I said before. I don't know what happened in that room, and I don't ever want to know. But I still have nightmares about those two glowing red lights in the darkness. And sometimes, as I lapse into sleep, I hear faint echoes of shrill laughter following me down into the depths of unconsciousness. I used to be a dangerous man, but something happened at my asylum. Well, if you're reading this, my name is Derek. That's all I want to say. I'm a dangerous man, someone you wouldn't like to be around. Whenever I'm around people, I have this urge to start a confrontation. I'm an aggressive type, and let's say I found my spot in an asylum for 30 years, or wouldn't have been in for that time. I strangled a man to death in a bar, broke someone's face with a wine bottle, killed someone with a knife, and... <laughs> Then things started escalating from there. I was arrested, and I was being put away for what would have been a long time. And then I put myself into even bigger trouble as I tried to assault the officers that were apprehending me. Broken officer's nose as I headbutted him as hard as I could. Then tried to shove the other one off of me. I grabbed one of their guns, shot the guy with a busted nose in the chest two times. The officer behind me shot me with a taser as I collapsed to the ground, convulsing and thrown into the car as the officer started speaking into his comms, rubbing his eyes, distressed. He shakes his head and gets into the car, waiting until someone came by to retrieve the officer and escort me to the precinct. Weeks later, I ended up in an asylum where I'd spent the better part of ten years in prison with other unstable cellmates. Some aggressive like me, and some just too psycho. I heard these stories about asylums. I always thought it was a joke. Oh, creepy atmosphere, weird shit going down, and a breed of people that you wouldn't believe. Well, I've seen crazy people here, dressed in straitjackets and screaming in some weird language. I wasn't scared of them. I would have liked to shut them up so I wouldn't have to hear them every day and night. Well, I haven't seen some of this weird shit yet. Well, not that any of it would bother me anyway. I have a strong stomach. Most of that came from being aggressive over the years. Grew up with parents that didn't care much about me at all. Didn't care that I'd have a bad day at school as some kid or bullies beat me up. And if I did try to get their attention, they'd threaten me. I had to learn to stop being so scared, so helpless, and I guess that ended up biting me later on. Now, in prison, the way I'd pass my time would be working out in my cell, or staring at the freaking ceiling. I wasn't allowed out of my cell. I was deemed too dangerous. I figured it was better that way. At least I had that. It went on like this for a long time. But then one prisoner checked in that actually made me wonder what he'd done to get into this asylum. 
he was quiet, calm, and he was never let out of his cell. Oh, he was a weird man, I'll tell you that. One of the prisoners across my cell, or next to it, had cut himself with a knife in the gut and died on the spot. Now, this new prisoner, I'll call him Steve, took his place. I'd see him every day, hunched over, his hands together, just staring at the floor. He only moves when it's time to eat. I don't notice him sleeping either. Well, from what I could tell. He just sits there. Motionless. It weirded me out a bit. There was something different about him. One day I decided to shout at him through my cell. Asking what he's in for. He just looks at me, blankly. His eyes were a little odd. They never blinked. And they look like they've seen some shit. He shakes his head. No. And then just stares at the floor again. What the hell did that mean? I decided to ask again. More demanding now. And he didn't move this time. Well, over time I tried to ignore him. But he was just so out of place. He never threatened anyone. And he never spoke. What the hell did this guy do? I shook my head and just tried to focus on push-ups. As the days went on, Steve just sat there, looking at the ground like a freaking psycho. Someone tries to talk to him, like I did, and he didn't respond. And this led to more people talking. And then he put his hands to his lips, shushing everyone as he spoke finally. But we still didn't know what the hell was going on. He muttered something weird, Something none of us understood. One of them shouted back. What does he mean? Then he just proceeded his daily routine. The prisoner who shouted had finally had enough and banged on the bars as he shouted at him, asking what his deal is and why he's in here. Why he never answers back. Why he's looking at the ground like some sicko. Steve must have been pissed, since he then directed his gaze towards the prisoner and has never turned away since then. He was starting to freak some of us out. And one day during mealtime, this other prisoner started coughing. It sounded like it was serious. And then I saw blood outside his cell. And then some more. The guards dropped the tray and opened the cell, trying to tend to the prisoner. Steve then directed his gaze back to the ground unfazed by what had just unfolded. Well, he was dragged out of his cell, coughing up more blood. He was taken to the infirmary, and we didn't hear back from him for hours. A lot of us took a bet that he probably died in there. God, what the hell had Steve done? Well, I tried not to look at him from there on out. But now, every night, he whispers to himself, he never speaks during the day. It's honestly freakier that he talks now. Another prisoner was dragged out of his cell, coughing up blood like the first one did. But this time, his limbs started to contort beyond their limits, and he died right there. Steve never acknowledged any of this. Gee, this guy is a psycho. Starting to see why he might have been put in here. It's like... These people are possessed or some shit. Granted, I never liked anyone here. But this is getting too weird for my tastes. I've always enjoyed breaking bones. But honestly, there's nothing quite like someone throwing their arms back and bones popping out. Yeah, I've broken bones. But I've never seen anything like this before. The guards are doing rounds around ourselves. Concerned about what's going on here. They speak into their comms every couple minutes, reporting their findings. Nothing out of place so far. One of the prisoners speaks up and tells the guards, That SOB is crazy. God, get us out of here. Guards don't acknowledge him. And moments later, another prisoner mentions the crazy prisoner. Then another one speaks up. The two guards look at each other, whispering. They've seen the prisoners and how on edge they are. 
And then something none of us could explain happens. Something grabs one of the guards from behind and starts to suffocate him. The guard grabs his throat as he starts to lose oxygen, his eyes turning black, his arms contorting. He dies on the spot, and the other guard calls it in. But immediately after, the dead guard's tongue lashes out and grabs the other one by the throat, thrashing him around. Everyone backs up in their cells, including me now. Everyone is shouting in horror. The dead guard's limbs snap back in place, and it's like something is controlling him. He stands to his feet with his crooked legs, and then we hear a loud snap as the other guard is slammed onto the ground. The guard's tongue had snapped the other one's neck, and then broken his spine. Well, probably broke more than that. The possessed guard's tongue continues to hang out, long enough to touch the ground tainted with dried bloodstains and vomit. The guard looks at a random prisoner and rips off the bars from the prison cell with his tongue and proceeded to do the most terrible thing. The guard's tongue goes through the prisoner's ear, extends through the other end, goes into one of his nostrils and rips out his eye sockets as his head falls in a disgusting mess. The screams would have kept me warm at night if I hadn't looked at what had just happened. God, this must be what hell is like. <laughs> right then, I begin to have second thoughts about my life choices. About the things I've done to get myself here. About how I could be next. Now, don't take this as me wussing out. Take it as a wake-up call or a death wish. I look at Steve, and that sick bastard is just rocking back and forth smiling. I hope he's happy. Well, I hope that monster rips him apart. And then, the monster grows two more tendrils on his back, ripping open his chest and pulling out his heart. It's not beating anymore. The blood and guts spill over the floor as the guard begins to scream in an unhuman cry. I don't know if it was happy, sad or angry, but I'll be damned if it wasn't hurt in the slightest. Oh, maybe this is my damnation after all I've done. The guard starts to transform as his face begins to give way, his mouth taking place on his face with hundreds of teeth, blood spilling out through him. His eye sockets rolling around on the floor, turning into a black blob and just sticking to the ground. This is beyond insane. The creature's arms turn into pinches with spikes, sticking out around his appendages. They look like bones. It can't be, but everything just seems so bizarre now. This has to be a nightmare or some shit. Something Steve did. This can't be real. The creature's back tendrils shoot at Steve's cell, rip out the bars, and pull him towards it as they bond together in one body growing two smaller arms at the sides of his ribcages, ripping out two of the previously mentioned bones to use as weapons. And then, the creature looks at me, growling menacingly. I suppose this is it. I suppose this is how I die. There's no way I can fight that thing. Maybe I deserve this. But at least I'll try to take it like a man. But then guards come and are frozen in fear as they see this abomination down the hallway. It turns his head backwards and sees them, laughing grimly. A guard opens the cells on this floor and tells everyone to run as fast as they can. None of us protested, and we all ran like hell. But I decided to look back. The guards start firing, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything. The monster's back tendrils grab the ribcage weapons and then propel towards the other guards. I decided I wasn't going to look back anymore, but then I saw some prisoners getting grabbed by their ankles, falling flat on their faces and screaming on their way back to the creature. I didn't want to look back. I just kept running. Oh, I couldn't shake the sound of bones cracking, the sound of silent screams. 
only for something else to take its place. Jeez, they're all being transformed. I just want to get out of here. I kick on the door to get out, but it requires a key. Oh, damn, I think to myself. I kick the door in frustration and decide to beat on it until something happens. There wasn't much else I could do. And then someone with an exposed ribcage comes up against the door, banging on it, trying to get to me. It's going to give soon. I look back and see dismembered bodies littered across the hallway. Oh, what a terrifying sight. The monster has grown in size. Heads from the prisoners seemingly a part of the abomination now, but still screaming. Their screams are that of terrible pain and fear. Their eyes pulled open by the tendrils, watching terror unfold. Tears falling down their eyes. Blood on the body where the heads lie. Arms sticking out of the morbid figure. And the figure has developed a sort of spider-like lower body, quickly coming my way. I look back, and the monster busts down the door, still trying to get me through the glass. But as soon as it breaks through the glass, I finally manage to push the door aside and try to keep running. The impact of the door, and being slammed against the hard floor, hurts like hell. But whatever it takes, I have to keep running. My heart is pounding in my chest. My head's racing with thoughts about what could come if I get caught by that thing. My adrenaline is at an insane high. And it only gets worse as I see more dismembered bodies and monsters wandering the asylum. Butchering so many people. Run, I think to myself every time I see a body. Or one cut in pieces still crawling. Don't stop until you exit the asylum. But shortly after, I get pinned down by a monster. It tries to bite my head off, but I grab a nearby chunk of rock that was broken off from a wall and swing it at the creature. It barely does anything against it. The creature then thrusts a blade into my abdomen, making me scream. I then feel something crawling inside and I try to hit the abomination in an exposed part of its body and the side of its head. I hit it as hard as I can, digging my thumb into its eye. The monster screams as its head bobs and weaves, trying to shake me off. It then thrusts the blade in my stomach even deeper in anger, and I can't let go. I dig my thumb into his other eye, and if I had a third thumb, well, I would shove that into an eye too. Resting in his mouth with a razor-sharp tongue coming out of the center. I try to dig my thumbs in deeper into the eye sockets, tightening my grip around his head. Then I hear a loud, booming, bone-chilling scream behind me. And I look up to see the beast with a dozen heads has increased in size yet again. A gluttonous spider demon making its way towards me, with multiple screams all in unison. I turn back to the monster on top of me as a tendril emerges from its back and tries to gouge out my eye. But I can see it's in a lot of pain. Finally, it collapses on top of me and I try to shove it off. I can barely stand up, but I have to. I feel something crawling inside my intestines and it rushes towards my brain. Oh, I can feel it digging into my brain. And then... I don't remember much else afterwards. It's like I blacked out or something. I find myself in the middle of an empty road. Bodies everywhere. Or, should I say, limbs are scattered around the pavement. Chaos everywhere. Maybe that thing took over me and I just ran away. But, oh, screw it, I'm just glad I got out. I don't know where I am, or what I am now. Maybe I'm some possessed monster. How much of this did I cause? Well, that I don't want to know. I'm writing this down so someone can read this and maybe, I don't know, maybe explain this better than me. I'm spending my days now in an abandoned house somewhere by myself. I don't know how many days have passed and I don't care. 
I just want to be alone. To contemplate what happened in that freaking asylum. I wonder how things have changed. But one day, my isolation is disturbed as a little girl, maybe 17, comes into my house with a note I'd written down. She doesn't show fear when she meets me. She just hands me the note back. We have to do something about these monsters, she remarks coldly, but I can't do it alone. Well, I hope you agree with me that they were pretty damn creepy, those five stories there. And did you like that theme? Uh, do you like me doing these more thematically organized videos? Please let me know because it's something I haven't really done that often in the past. But a lot of the channels are doing this kind of thing, putting a bunch of stories together on a particular theme, and it seems to be much more popular than the stuff that I do. I guess not everyone just wants to hear a good story, they just prefer, you know, the thematically organized stuff. Well, each to their own. But if you like this and you want me to keep going, please let me know, and I'll certainly think about it. Uh, it's no great thing at all for me to do this. Uh, the stories are good enough, so keep on trucking, like they say. That's Monday done and dusted already. Um, Tuesday's my day off. Uh, try not to do anything related to the channel on Tuesday. It's important to uh, keep your brain in check and give yourself a bit of downtime. But I'll be back again on Wednesday. Thursday there will be a podcast, and on Friday I'll be back here. Probably do something on Sunday as well. Had a couple of Sundays off, but back in action now. Okay? Well, enough for me for one evening, but I'll be back again very soon, whatever happens. Till then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.